Great to be with you for the third Sunday of Easter. We're going to be looking at all four of the scriptures today. Uh, first of all, um, Acts chapter 3 tells about uh, Peter and John. They're healing a lame man at the temple gate. And then the things that Peter said to the people after that took place. Let's uh, take a look at a couple pictures so we can get ourselves situated. Uh, there is in Jerusalem a model of Jerusalem from the time of Jesus. And in that model here is the temple. And uh, you can see how the people would access the temple up through uh, these doors. And then you come up to this uh, courtyard area. And um, this was the retaining wall that was built by Herod the Great so that he was able to greatly expand the temple a courtyard area, then the temple itself is here. And what's today known as the Western Wall is over here. It's not a wall of the temple, but instead part of the retaining wall. Uh, Herod the Great, the Herod of Jesus' birth, um, was a very paranoid, evil person, but also a tremendous builder. And the way that he expanded the temple and made it into an incredible building. So there's a model of Jerusalem in the end. Oh, and we've talked about how the Romans had a fortress, the Fortress Antonia, the northwest corner of Temple Mount. And that totally upset the Jews that here they could, uh, you know, keep watch uh, looking down at the courtyard to make sure that, that nothing was going on that they should be alarmed about. Uh, here in the next picture, we see a, a close-up of the temple area the courtyard, and then the building, and it was an incredibly built, beautiful building. Well, uh, this lame man had been at the temple gate uh, begging, and he begs uh, to Peter and John, and Peter and John say, we have no money to give you, but in the name of Jesus, we'll give you what we can, rise up and walk. Now, I mentioned in the study guide that in Lutheran youth ministry in the early 70s, like 50 plus years ago, there was a song we would sing based upon this incident. We'd all be sitting down and we start out with the words of Peter, silver and gold, have I none? And we go, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then we would all stand up and we would jump. He went walking and leaping, and then we would go like this, praising God, walking and leaping and praising God in the name of Jesus Christ. Of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then because it was a Lutheran song, we'd all sit down and we would reverently sing, Amen. Well, that was a fun thing to do, Lutheran youth ministry in the early 1970s. <laughs> Miss those days. So, well, but, but notice what Peter says. This, this attracts quite an attention because people had been seeing him for a long time. Um, I remember that there was a, like, a, we would go to concerts at the Hollywood Bowl and there was a ventriloquist who would always be out there in front of where you would get the bus to go uh, back to the parking lot where you had parked your car at. And uh, he was singing away and we just, uh, you just kind of knew that he was there and he was always there. Well, this man had been there a long time and so everybody knew who he was and everybody knew that something had happened. So this caused quite a stir. And then notice Peter's very pointed sermon. Peter addressed the people. And he says in verse, uh, you wonder how, well, don't, we are not by own piety and power. We were not able to do this. But instead, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. And then notice the very pointed way in which he talks to the Jewish people who had shouted demanding Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus, whom you handed over, and Jesus, whom you rejected in the presence of Pilate, Though Pilate had wanted to release him, but you rejected him and kept on screaming until Pilate agreed to crucify him. I asked the question, how could you possibly account for the tremendous change that had taken place in Peter? Um, Pentecost is Acts 2, this is Acts 3, so it's shortly after Pentecost. So it's like, you know, eight weeks or so after Easter. And so it had not been long before where Peter denied his Lord in order to save his own skin. 
How could you possibly account for the tremendous change that had taken place within Peter in like an eight-week period, except the fact that he had seen Jesus alive? More pointed language. You rejected the holy and righteous one. You asked for a murderer instead, Barabbas. Verse 15, you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. Well, he's the one who has made this man strong. And then it's interesting, the language, this man whom you see and know. You know, you know that something has taken place because you have seen him begging here for years. It's a man that you see, a man that you know. It is so obvious that something has happened because you have seen what he was like before and you can see what he's like now. The faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. A powerful example of the power of God, visible to all because they knew the before and they also knew the after. Whom you see and know, and in the presence of all of you. I mentioned in the study guide, Mark 5.19. This is after Jesus delivers the demoniac along the uh, south, the south east side of the Sea of Galilee. And remember how the demoniac, who had been demonized by a legion of demons, you know, wanted to go with Jesus. Please let me go with you. You have delivered me. I want to be with you. And you can understand that he would want to be with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, because if you come with me, you will then be sharing your life experience with people who did not know what your life was like before. And so instead, you need to go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. You will be most effective in your witness to people who knew what your life was like before. And so this layman also, because he was someone that everybody had probably seen many, many times and either had given alms to or had not, this would be something that would be powerful because he was a known person. Then Peter says, And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets uh, that Jesus was spoken of in the Old Testament, that his Messiah would suffer. And this is what was so totally unexpected for the Jewish people. The Messiah, God's anointed, God's chosen, the expected of it to be, the, the conquering king, the one who would bring back the glory days of David. And the whole concept that the Messiah would suffer was totally foreign to their concept of the Messiah. Well, the prophets had said that the Messiah would suffer. Now repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So again, a powerful testimony to the, to the change that took place in Peter uh, uh, since the night of the Jesus' betrayal and arrest because he had seen that Jesus was alive and how this miracle was powerful because people had seen what this person had been like before. Now let's go to the psalm. And it's really like each one of these verses really leads us to ask ourselves questions. How does this verse relate to me in my life? Answer me when I call, O God. When have you most fervently called upon God, and how has he answered you? Defender of my cause, when have you most experienced God as defending you? You set me free when I was in distress. When was a time when you were in distress and God set you free? And what has God set you free from? Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How has God displayed his mercy to you? And when especially can you think of where he heard your prayer? Verse 3, know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. What are some particular wonders that God has done for you? The Lord will hear me when I call. When is he and how has he heard you when you've called? Verse 7, you have put gladness in my heart more than when wine and grain abound. You have given me more gladness than the most happy of happy hours. When has and how has God particularly put gladness in your heart? Verse 8, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me rest and secure. Are you able to lie down and sleep? And does God 
make your rest secure. If you're able to lie down and sleep in peace, what makes you able to do that? And if you are not, what prevents you from doing that? And how could God make your rest secure so that you would be able to sleep better? Sleep is a wonderful thing. We all need the gift of sleep. For those who, because of turmoil or whatever, are not able to sleep, we need to pray for them that they will be able to rest secure in God so that they will be able to sleep. Now let's look at 1 John 3. See the second reading. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. I put on the study sheet John 1, 12 to 13. John, when he wrote his gospel, said, those who receive Christ have become the children of God. And uh, so the whole idea of being a child of God and, and what a privilege that is. Verse 2 is a biblical example of the, of the tension in the scriptures between already and not yet. The blessings of God that we already have, and yet we do not fully experience them. There's the already and the not yet. We are God's children now, but what we will be has not yet been received. One person said, I'm not what I'm going to be, but thank God that I'm not, that I'm not what I was. What had God has done in my life already, and yet what he has yet to do. It's kind of like Jesus during his ministry performed miracles, healed sick, raised the dead, and so on, gave uh, sight to the blind and restored the lame. He didn't heal everybody, but he gave demonstrations of the power of God so that there was evidence already of what would then in the future be experienced completely after the resurrection. So how would you say that I'm experiencing God's blessings already and yet I also know that a fuller experience of God's blessings um, I am not experiencing yet. Now let's look at the gospel reading. Um, this incident happened on Easter Sunday evening. Jesus had spent some time with two of his disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, joined them for dinner, and then suddenly disappeared. And so when they go back to Jerusalem, I believe that the gathering in Luke 24 is the same as the first time that Jesus met with the disciples after the resurrection, Easter Sunday night in John 20, the time when Thomas was not uh, with them. Now, let's look at uh, the map here of the road to Emmaus. Here we have Jerusalem, and here are two possible locations for Emmaus. Um, the, the issue is that some ancient biblical texts say that Emmaus was 60 stadia away from Jerusalem, and some say that it was 160 stadia away from Jerusalem. A stadion, O-N, not U-M, like a football stadium, a stadion is about 600 feet. And so if it was 60 stadium, it would have been about seven miles from Jerusalem. And if it was 160 stadia, then it would be about 19 miles from Jerusalem. And so you have more than one location for Emmaus. Personally, I think the 60 makes more sense because um, if Jesus had walked with the disciples to Emmaus and then joined them for dinner, and then the Emmaus disciples run back to Jerusalem, it kind of makes, it's a little more plausible, I think, that this, that this was a seven-mile trip back, not a 19-mile trip back. And so they gathered with, they find the disciples in uh, the upper room. And uh, here is the location. It is called the Senecal, uh, the uh, Latin word for meal is C-E-N-A, Senna. So the location of the, um, of the upper room here would be, is called the Senecal. Um, you can see where the Temple Mount is. Um, and so Jesus would have had the Last Supper with the disciples here and then would have gone to the Garden of Gethsemane uh, to agonize in prayer, be arrested, and then come down to Caiaphas' house where he was tried and so on. Now I believe that... Um, this upper room, it's an upper 
um, upper guest room, an upper great room, an upper fellowship eating room is the same place where, to me, it makes sense that this is the upper room for the Last Supper. And it makes sense to me that, that after Easter Sunday, when uh, Easter Sunday evening when the disciples are gathered together, they would have gathered in the same room that they had gathered before with Jesus. And then the following Sunday, and then after the ascension, they were all gathered together, united in prayer, and they were all together together on Pentecost Sunday. Um, so it makes sense to, to me that, that this was such a special place for them, that this would have been uh, where, they would have, where they would have gathered. There's a reference in Acts chapter 19 that after Peter is arrested and then miraculously de uh, delivered, he goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, who is the author of the second gospel. And there were disciples that were uh, gathered there praying for him, praying for his release. And as they're praying for his release, he is released and appears at the door. And so that is the one, and, and assuming that the disciples again would have met in the same place where they had had the Last Supper, Easter Sunday night, the following week, after the Ascension, Pentecost Sunday, that it just makes sense that that's where they continue, would have continued to gather. And so that's why I thought it probably was the house of the mother of the author of the second gospel where this took place. I have heard that the, this room uh, follows the same footprint of the size of the room and of the building in New Testament times. And so in other words, to have a room this big as a gather, second floor gathering room, this was a rather wealthy, a well-resourced person. Well, um, they, the Emmaus disciples, Jesus is with them. Um, Jesus disappears. They get up, run back to Jerusalem, and found the 11 and their companions gathered together. In John 20, it only mentions that 10 of the disciples are there. Remember, Thomas isn't there and Judas is dead, so the 10 disciples. But here in Luke, and I, I believe is describing the same event, there were other people, other followers of Jesus that were there that night as well. And they said, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told them what had happened on the road, how Jesus had met with them, how Jesus had interpreted the Old Testament to them, and how their hearts burned within them as they heard Jesus interpret the scriptures and explain the scriptures. And it was when he broke bread that they recognized him. He became known to them in the breaking of the bread. And again, I believe that this gathering is the same as the one Easter Sunday night when Thomas isn't there in John chapter 20. And then suddenly Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? And that really is a good question for all of us. There are so many reasons to be frightened today. And so a question for all of us is, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? And notice what Jesus does, what Jesus gives them and what Jesus does for them to help deal with their fears. I mentioned for those that are afraid of the future, what Jesus did, he gave unmistakable evidence of his resurrection. For those who are afraid of the past, what they have done and their own guilt and shame, Jesus gives the promise of forgiveness of sins. And for those who feel powerless in the present, Jesus promises power from on high, which is the sending of the Holy Spirit in a few days. So notice how Jesus, what Jesus does and says, and how he addresses those same fears. And would you say, you yourself right now, are you more, or how are you afraid of the future? How are you afraid of the past? And do you feel powerless in the present? And what can you, what, Notice what Jesus has for you to deal with your fears of the future, fears of the past, and feeling of powerlessness 
in the present. For those who are afraid of the future, Jesus gives unmistakable evidence of his resurrection. He says, look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. A couple weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 15, I think that was for Easter Sunday, that's where Paul gives the most complete description of all the people and groups of people that Jesus appeared to alive after Easter Sunday. One time, 500 people at one particular time. Touch me and see. If you wonder if it's really me, you can touch me. I am physically present. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And he showed them his hands and his feet with the wounds in his hands and his feet. And while in their joy, they were still disbelieving and still wondering, he said, well, let me do this for you. Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. He showed that he was real, that he had truly resurrected because of his eating fish. And for those who are afraid of the future, Jesus gives unmistakable evidence of the resurrection. Because Jesus has defeated sin, death, and the power of the devil, because Jesus is alive, really that addresses my greatest fears of the future. For those who are afraid of the past, he promises forgiveness of sins. He then said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Here Jesus is saying that, um, you know, it's not just that later Christians believe that these things talked about Jesus, but he said, they do talk about me. The law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms do talk about me. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. When have you felt that Jesus has, in a particular way, opened your mind so that you could understand a Bible passage? And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer. We talked about that with the first reading, how the whole concept of the Messiah suffering is so contrary to what they expected. The Messiah is to suffer, rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be reclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Repentance and forgiveness of sins. Repent is what we need to do, and forgiveness is what we need to receive. At the memorial service for uh, Lee Stengem last Saturday, uh, we sang the song, you know, When Peace Like a River. And I was just really struck by, um, by the words of the third verse. Uh, He lives, O the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. My sin, my where I have fallen short, the things where I have failed to do what I should do and done what I shouldn't have done, that has been nailed to the cross and through faith in Christ I need to bear it no more of the, I don't need to be afraid of the past. And then for those who feel powerless in the present, he promises power from on high. See, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. I will send the Holy Spirit. And so just kind of hang out in the city now. You know, this is Easter Sunday night, and, and, and seven weeks later, the Holy Spirit is coming on the day of Pentecost. Just kind of hang out. And again, I think that it was, as described in Acts 1, the same upper room where they hung out until the day of Pentecost. Stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. You know, we all need a power beyond ourselves. There are things that we can do and take care of by ourselves. But the most critical, important, and difficult things in life are beyond what we can do. And so we all need that power from on high. So, how are you afraid? What about the future scares you? Jesus is alive. What about your past scares and burdens you? Jesus offers forgiveness of sins. And do you feel powerless in the present? Jesus offers you and gives you power from on high. And so let's pray. 
Our Lord Jesus, there are so many reasons why each one of us has to be afraid. So many things in our world and in our lives that are just simply scary. And um, we think of how the disciples, their lives were crushed. And they were, they were, it even says in John that the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. And then to that situation you came, you appeared, and you, pray, you addressed their fears. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you also can address our fears. We, we pray for those that are living in particular fear. We pray for those who have fear of the future, that you assure them that you are alive. We pray for those who feel burdened and overwhelmed by their past. We pray that you will make real to them the gift of forgiveness. And we pray for those who feel powerless to deal with the challenges of their present. Give them that power from on high. In Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.